exciting and an honor to be presenting uh, Mami Malek from uh, who founded the Stand for Education. Uh, we did this project uh, with Marie and Diandra uh, that uh, featured uh, the jewelry of Jacques Jarich, who is not here, but we have here Alex Koronkovas, the photographer, fantastic, who is here. And uh, the sale of the jewelry and the photographs benefit her foundation. It's about giving money for education, and specifically, she will explain her campaign, No Pad, No School. And we'll be matching funds right, for every donation you make. So. Yes, every donation you guys make, Valerie Goodman Gallery is matching it. So thank you, Valerie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you, Jax. And thank you, Alex, for this amazing project. So I'm going to start with just telling you my name, Mari Malek, and I'm from South Sudan. And I am a former refugee, and I started uh, the nonprofit organization called Stand for Education, which we both dearly advocate for, as well as our um, company together called Models of Purpose, because we believe that we should um, give back as models and as creative beings and as people who have been given a chance in life. So, um, <coughs> Everything started by me sharing my story a few years ago, but I started to get deeper into sharing my story more and more because I found it to connect more with people and a human form. And I go back to South Sudan every year since 2015, since we escaped, my mother and I escaped the war um, in early 90s, we lived in Egypt in refugee camps for about four to five years until we were granted um, asylum and came to the USA. And that's where I got discovered to model and my mother wanted us to have a good education and rights. And um, since then I started traveling back and giving back to my country because I said I didn't want to be just a model, I wanted to be able to be a model with purpose, give back and use my platform versus letting my platform use me. So last year, 2018 in May, I went back for the fourth time in South Sudan and I spoke to some women because my thing is about transparency. We have to connect human to human, heart to heart. And knowing what people have been through, um, we can never tell that until we walk the shoes of that person. But I spoke to some women and girls and what their needs were and how can we help them. And the number one thing that always stood out is education. The same thing that my mother decided to do when she escaped with myself and my sisters. And one of the women shared her story with me, which I want to, sh to read to you because this is the story of not just her, it's the story of what could have been me, could have been a way, what has been our mothers and our grandmothers, our sisters, and our friends who are still living in refugee camps today as we speak. So this is the story of Nancy. I, that's her name for now, because she didn't want to disclose all of her name. So as we celebrate tonight, I want you guys to know women in South Sudan have very little to celebrate. And me and Awain are the catalysts for their stories to shed light on it and to remind people about them and that they exist. So I was in Juba, South Sudan last year, and I spoke to Nancy. And this is what I wrote and spoke to her about. Wiping her tears from her cheeks, the young woman describes how she has resorted to prostitution to feed her children. When South Sudan civil war broke out in 2013, her family fled their home to avoid violence. Her husband, took her and their two children to a UN camp for safety. He has not been since then seen and is presumed dead. 
bright and resourceful, she found offers of work as a cleaner and a waitress, but she said her male employers demanded sex. She said, if you refuse to sleep with them, you'll never get a job. They'll tell you to come tomorrow for work, but then start calling you the night before asking to sleep in your house. If she didn't respond to their demands, they would show up to work the next day and to find her and threaten her. And this will happen not to only her, but woman after woman. In three years, four bosses threatened to fire the young mother unless she had sex with them, she said. One of them told her it was company policy. After such exploitation, Nancy said she decided to do sex work where she said she has more control and makes more money to care for her children who are now aged four and seven. I'm embarrassed, she said, her eyes were guarding with fear and crying. But it's my only way out. Nancy had reported the aggressors, but the authorities wouldn't do anything or believe her. She said I would just go home and cry. So, South Sudan right now remains a country where women face grinding difficulties. And while we're here across the world and we're fighting for our rights and we have these choices and we have the Me Too movement, there are young girls globally that are suffering and need so much light because they don't have the platforms that we have, the access that we have, social media, people who care for them. So we need to end sexual assault, and we need to help girls like us go to school, and not just go to school, but go to school in dignity. And that's why we're gathered here tonight, so I can share a little bit of their story, my story, knowing story, which she'll be sharing with you right now. So tonight we're here for girls like Nancy, girls like us, and many girls that are in refugee camp. I introduce you to Awendi Shara's story as well. <laughs> Hello, uh, good evening actually. So my name is Awendi Mamini Chaw. I am 20 years old and I am from Australia. I recently moved to New York City, three days ago to be exact. Um, so I'm from Sydney, so I'm Australian. I was born in Kakuma, uh, the north, which is a refugee camp in the north of Kenya. Um, as a kid, I really didn't have a home, I guess people would say. I was a child who was very, um, I guess, awake. I knew my surroundings. My parents couldn't hide anything from me, actually. Like, it was very hard for them to say, that was my gun, that person's not dead, because I saw everything. So, as I grew up in Kenya, in Kakuma to be specific, my mother was a 15-year-old uh, mother. So she gave birth to me at 15, and uh, by 19, she had five children. So as a 19 year old, we were in Kenya, Kakuma, and my mother wanted us to get out, basically. And she started demanding that my grandparents, who were intellectuals, who knew English, who had access, who were in the government and everything, to get us out. My grandparents are people who just didn't want to support their then 19 year old that decided to rebel against their rules and the culture and went to give birth out of wedlock. And uh, my mother had to work on her own. And I remember when I was five, I saw this lady. I never called my mom, mom, until I went to Australia. I didn't understand the concept of mom. I never saw her, because she was always so out there. She was either talking to the United Nations about medicine, or her pregnancy, or my sister who had cerebral palsy. And as a kid, I just saw her, and I called her Mary. That's my mom's first name. I never called her mom ever, like until I turned seven, I believe. So then, the process of us getting to Australia was a very difficult process, but she made it happen. So at seven years old, about a turn eight, we got onto a flight and we went to Australia. We went to Sydney. Um, the culture shock in Australia was one of absolute clear, I guess you could say. It was clear as day, we don't belong here, what are you doing here, you're from refugee camp. And Australia is a country that is known for its xenophobia. 
And as a kid, I knew everything. So as soon as I entered school, I started realizing I didn't speak the same language as these people. I don't understand what's on my what's what's on the paper. I don't get two plus two. I don't know anything. And my mother was so adamant on me not focusing on the not getting and focusing on what I knew. And that's when education came in. So I was an avid reader. I was someone who was determined to get things done. And now I'm a law student at one of the best universities in Australia. So last year I came to New York for the first time for Fashion Week and I bumped across a, a video on Facebook where Marie here was talking about Stanford education. As a person, I'm someone who likes to watch things from the, from the sidelines. I like to see things process, I like to see things unfold and then get involved. And when I approached her, she's basically my mother now, but I approached her as a sister. <laughs> I approached her as a sister to ask about this foundation, stand for education, because I stand for many things. I stand for LGBT rights, I stand for human rights, I stand for just dignity. And I realized that there was someone in our community that spoke the same language as me, that understood that I didn't know what two plus two was at seven, that I didn't understand English, I didn't understand Australia. And I kind of connected with her spiritually. Like she knew where I was from, she knew the story, she's from New York City, I'm from Australia, two different worlds. And yeah, I approached her and I got in contact with her and I joined Models for Purpose, with purpose. I am a model, um, proud actually, a proud model. And she basically said for me to jump on board and to be here today is such an honor for me personally because I've watched this company, Stanford Education, this non-profit organization kind of build up and I see models that I aspire to be and actually inspire me actually talk about Stanford Education, support Stanford Education like Danger, uh, her best friend, Yami. So for me, it's so important that we gather, make gatherings like this and actually talk about our stories and make open dialogues about things that are not ever spoken about in schools or even in the <coughs> education for girls. And the No Pad, No, no School campaign, which um, Marie um, has released basically, is something that is so important to me because to me personally, I just believe that as women, we really have it hard. We have it so hard. We're a woman and we just, we're on the lower pedestal in society, I guess you could say. And to go to school is almost, like mostly an honor, it's literally an honor. And to kind of decide when you go to school, whether to stay home for five days because you're period and you don't have the right products to you, to use is kind of a painful reality for like millions of girls in South Sudan, millions of girls, technically 3.5 million girls in Kakum, where I was born and where I was brought up. And for me, it just, it saddens me to know that 3.2 million girls can't go to school sometimes because they're, you know, their menstrual cycle is here, which is a natural thing that happens to all women and most women. And when it does happen, you can't control it. It's a, your body literally releasing things from your, um, your test times, I guess you could say. And yeah, so we are here today to basically support this organization, both these organizations. That means so much to me and to Marie, and I'm assuming to most of you in the room because you are here today. And yeah, I am away. Oh. <laughs> where we can use our platforms to make a change, especially when we have crazy old leaders. And, um, you know, we have the choice to make changes for ourselves and for others. We don't have to wait for anybody to make it for us. Um, so that's why we're here. And with that said, we want you to help us support 1,000 girls from South Sudan to go to school in 2019 by um, providing them with access to education and menstrual health products. These menstrual hygiene products are the most important thing right now for them because it keeps them going to school in dignity. We're already supporting these girls to go to school, but we have to help them with basic, simple needs such as that. 